Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started as folks come in. Um, thank you for joining us today um, for the session on exploring recommendations for a more equitable future in science education and workforce development. Um, we have really uh, exciting uh, talk, talking points for you all and uh, experts here to discuss this topic um, who have both science and education backgrounds. Uh, we'll talk about the various aspects of the field, um, where the field is now and um, how we envision it in the future to think through um, how to support the next generation of scientists and build a future workforce. Um, I will introduce um, the panelists in a second. I wanted to just send you um, the link to the session for more background if you'd like to review while we're talking here. Hold on a second. There we go. Okay. And then also, um, if you have questions, you can feel free to uh, place them into the chat uh, or send them to me directly and we'll moderate um, after we get through our questions. So with that, um, I'm going to um, Uh, introduce myself first. So I'm Adriana Bankston. Um, I wear a lot of hats, but for the purposes of this conversation, um, I'm a senior fellow in civic science and public policy with Sigma Xi, the scientific research honor society, uh, working on a project to catalyze engagement of scientists and policymaking at the state and local level. And I'm also a strategic advisor for the Journal of Science Policy and Governance, which is a nonprofit organization and open access and peer review journal publishing policy research from early career scientists, students, postdocs, and policy fellows. And uh, I have a strong interest in training and developing the future STEM pipeline and workforce, uh, which is why this session was developed. So thank you for being here today. So we'll go through um, um, the introduction slightly differently from the um, order in the panel, just because uh, I want to talk through the folks that are um, doing specific types of work and then sort of group together. So Brittany Aguilar is a science associate at Smooch Futures. Um, it's a New York-based philanthropy dedicated to catalyzing the next scientific revolution through funding of innovative research. She manages um, the AI Science Postdoc Fellowship, uh, which is a $148 million endeavor aimed at accelerating the impact of AI in machine learning and advancing science and society. Um, beyond her role in this program, she contributes to a number of other initiatives on science communication, graduate training, and, and other projects. Um, next, we have Leah Carnes, um, who is the Associate Director of Executive um, Office Scientific Programs at IV. This is a nonprofit um, that develops vaccines, antibodies for HIV, tuberculosis, emerging infectious diseases. Prior to her role here, um, she was a program officer at National Academies, working on the board on health science policy and also biophysical society congressional science fellow before that. And she obtained her PhD in biophysics um, from, from Johns Hopkins. Pelirus Celis Ramirez um, is a medical distinguished lecturer at the City University of New York um, School of Medicine in Molecular Cell and Biomedical Sciences. She teaches neuroscience, endocrinology, human reproduction, and the practice of medicine. And she's really passionate about mentoring students at every level, um, including high school, undergrad, grad students, medical students, and um, helping further um, careers of, of students in the sciences. Stephen Albright uh, is an associate director for awards uh, on the awards and fellowships team at the New York Academy of Sciences. And he manages um, a range of different programs, recognizing and supporting and rewarding young scientists. Um, also new technologies and innovative educators um, for the benefit of global society. And he obtained his PhD in physics from Yale. And last but not least, um, Shailen Jatishi is a senior advisor for education, labor, and the future of work at New America. And he's also a fellow at the World Economic Forum Center for Trustworthy Technology and a Forbes contributor 
covering workforce and education innovation. Uh, his expertise consists in designing cross-sectoral research strategy and policy innovations to build a better and fairer future of learning and work for all. So thank you all for being here today. Um, as I said, we will cover um, sort of the field broadly and touch upon a few aspects, um, and then we'll have time for uh, audience questions too. Um, broadly speaking, the different types of uh, questions we have are thinking through the landscape of education and workforce development, um, what actors are involved, and what does it mean to be equitable and inclusive in this field? Um, and also, how do we think about moving the needle towards changing culture um, to improve um, the system and what kind of tools and resources are needed? Um, and also, as I said, uh, gearing this towards the next generation, how we can support students who are in science and um, want to go into the workforce and um, how we're training them for that as well. So I'll have to cover the next hour or so. Um, the first section will focus on structures, tools, and resources. And uh, we'll start with Brittany. Uh, if you can tell us a little bit about what you work on. Um, and how that contributes to building education and workforce of the future. Yeah, sure. Um, so in my role at Schmidt Futures, uh, I co-lead a program called the Eric and Wendy Schmidt AI and Science Postdoc Fellowship. This is a fellowship that um, is, it, it, we have like nine satellite sites. So there are nine universities. Each university has about 10 fellows. Um, they're all postdocs. They're different kinds of scientists. So some of them are like ecologists or biologists or engineers or physicists, and they have their PhD in something else. And they go to this postdoc fellowship to learn how to apply machine learning methods to their work. And so we have kind of like a very specialized subgroup of people. And we're trying to um, get in many ways, like the most diversity of ideas possible um, in this group of people. And um, I think there's a lot of research that shows that the most diversity of ideas come from the most diversity of like uh, people. And so what my role is in leading this program, I don't like physically make the selection of who the universities recruit to be in their programs, but we have a lot of conversations about like values and the types of uh, programming that we're gonna be implementing and who would be interested in that and how to, how to source people because I think a lot of effort goes into like, training them <laughs> and if you know how to find the money then you don't have to worry about um you know if you if your boss is a person who would be like re recommending you for a program like this if you're already in a position of of privilege to to know about it then it's much easier to get um money like this than it is if you were maybe less resourced so i also have a lot of conversations with these universities about how to like find postdocs and like what types of conferences to go to like sigma Psi is like a really good example of um a group of people that are that are organizing around um lifting up like underrepresented scientists uh so in addition to organizing programming having lots of partner relationships with the different universities um we also run a lot of events uh for the postdocs and those events have primarily focused on um, technical backgrounds and bringing in tech scientists to talk, had give technical talks. Uh, we had a couple of talks in our most recent conference that were more focused on professional development skills, things like media training and science communication and um, different ways of visualizing data. And I, those were really well received. And so I think that we're going to start focusing more on these. Um, maybe non-traditional skill development for the postdocs because it's like what they really want. Um, and I would say like also as it relates toward like education and development, um, getting a lot of feedback from the community about like meeting their needs, I think is another big part of my job as like a community. But I'm kind of like a cross between a program manager and a community builder. And, you know, that it's like I have a lot of different um, functions in this program, but they kind of know what they need on some level. And so a, a lot of my job is also like helping to figure out how to give them what they what they need. Thank you. Yeah, that's a really good start. And I think, you know, I wanted to start with you because uh, funders play a really important role in this field and, you know, what's being funded dictates a lot of what's being done in trainings and um, um, Schmidt definitely has, plays a, a strong role there. 
but um, also um, good framing in terms of DEI and the different types of um, trainings we can think think about to to meet the needs of the audience. So um, transitioning now to Stephen, uh, who works on developing training. So tell us a little bit about um, how the structure within the New York Academy facilitates this um, within your work. Sure. Thank you, Adriana. So um, I'm a little bit on the opposite side of the equation from Brittany. We're a donor-funded nonprofit, um, and we have a variety of programs uh, targeting um, areas critical for the public good that tend to be underserved by the broader scientific community. So um, building equitable and inclusive educational workforce is uh, definitely one of those areas that requires more focus. So the Academy is this is one of the areas that they're they're seeking to address through a range of programs that cross career stages of, of scientists. Uh, we have the Junior Academy and the Interstellar Initiative, which builds education programs for primary and secondary students, gives them exposure to science, um, and kind of provides that connection to scientists, both locally in New York City and underserved populations, but also around the globe. Uh, we have extensive mentorship and scientists in residence programs, again, to provide direct mentorship by current scientists of uh, students interested in science. We also have the Science Alliance, which uh, helps develop professional development skills uh, for particularly undergraduates, graduate students, postdocs, and early uh, career scientists. And honestly, that's, I believe, how I met you, Adriana, at a Science Alliance event several years ago. Um, and we also have uh, extensive awards uh, program business, which is where I'm working now. Um, much of our awards are focused on recognizing uh, early career scientists, so postdocs and uh, faculty. That's what I've spent most of my time the last couple of years at the academy. Um, but we're we're starting to try to expand our portfolio to address kind of other aspects. I think our our existing portfolio. Um, does address uh, some of these issues around equity inclusion in education, particularly by trying to support younger scientists from a wide range of backgrounds um, with completely unrestricted prize, prizes. Um, so this gives them funding to do whatever kind of they are passionate about. It gives them validation that their work is important and it gives them freedom to pursue their interests. Um, and I and we've seen a lot of our past awardees go off and do new high risk, high reward projects. They've put that money towards education and outreach programs. Um, so it, it, it's it, it's really freeing to have kind of a big um, source of funding that they can do how they use however they want. But I think you know beyond that. Uh, there's, I think these challenges would benefit from other more focused recognition avenues. Um, something we're looking into is building these kinds of high profile prizes or awards um, to target innovators in this space. Um, so we can give this kind of unrestricted funding to the individuals who are already making an impact. That way we can accelerate their efforts, we can elevate their work to a global stage and uh, bring attention to the solutions that are working. Um, and build a community of shared practice uh, so we can iteratively test and improve efforts um, to increase equity and inclusion uh, in, in science. So I, that's, we're, we're still developing that. I'm hoping um, that we'll be, hoping I'll be able to spend a little bit more time on that um, moving forward. But yeah, I'm excited to chat a little bit more about all of these uh, topics with the rest of the panel. Very exciting. Well, uh, it's really inspiring the work you're doing um, to support the next generation. And of course, it seems like the question of access and supporting under underserved um, students has come up already a couple of times. So we'll, we'll come back to this. Um, and also the idea of supporting early career researchers and what that means um, from the academy is really, uh, uh, really interesting work there. Um, okay, so Moving forward, um, let's get a little more into sort of practical tools and um, how we can begin to address some of these challenges and, and um, support students in, in science um, through the initiatives that you all are working on. So I'll turn to um, Leah to talk about what AIVI is doing um, in terms of education. Yeah, I... Um kind of love following Brittany and Steven because 
I see them kind of on this push side of training in these fellowships, really supporting the young scientists. And I think the work we do at IAVI is a little bit more on the poll side. So um, as a bit of background, I know Adriana introduced us, but we are a nonprofit vaccine developer. So we were founded with the mission to develop a vaccine against HIV. And now we've expanded um, into tuberculosis, other emerging infectious diseases. Um, and in order to do this research uh, in the communities that they that these diseases impact, you have to do the research there. Um, and so what that means is we do have, you know, a presence in, in the United States, but so much of our research is done um, throughout Africa and India. Um, and so we need a workforce there. We need scientists able to conduct the research on these problems that are most important to those communities. Um, so we partner, we have a longstanding history of partnering with um, often academic institutions and um, we have what um, is called a, a clinical research centers. Um, throughout uh, Africa. And we partner with them to bring the work. So it's one thing to train a scientist and we do have programs where, um, you know, for example, an African scientist can go train in our lab in London or scientists from our lab in California can go um, and work with scientists in Africa, but without work to be done, without research, um, those scientists that you've trained won't have work to do. So, um, you know, it's really important to us that the scientific questions come from local researchers and um, there are, is clinical and preclinical work to be done there. So that's where we get into really making the training in the community building sustainable because it, you can't just train scientists and have no work to be done. So um, that's really the core of IAVI's model of when we're doing our research and developing our products is that um, those communities, those researchers are really at the center of the research questions that we ask. Um, and it's really paying dividends and it's exciting. And I think it, more and more funders are now getting on board with this idea of localization. So that the funding for this research should be going directly to those scientists. And we fully support that because that's been our model for over 25 years. Um, and it's it's exciting to see it in practice now. That's great. Thank you for raising those points. I think um, thinking more through the partnerships too, because as we as we want to develop the future pipeline and who else needs to be involved. And uh, also you mentioned some of the different countries. So keeping in mind the international aspect of um, this conference too, and how this is um, potentially needs to be adapted to different education models. Um, and also loved your point about centering this on people, which hopefully will be a common thread here, which I think we've we sort of touched upon that, but maybe we'll come back to this. Um, okay, so uh, now that we have a um, broad framework of what we're discussing, we want to move more into talking about specific actors and how to think through the best practices and, and culture change that we'll talk about towards the end. Um, so I'll turn to Shailen now to tell us a little bit about um, how we can align more education and work. So we've talked about sort of training, but how to really take this into uh, the workforce and training people for what they're doing after. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks very much, Adriana, and uh, it's an honor to be with you all today. Um, just to give everybody a little bit of a sense of the, the lens that I'm using, uh, I come from New America. We're a nonprofit uh, think tank based in D.C. Uh, we, are, we are a research organization, and we also emphasize storytelling and narrative changes in our approach. So uh, a lot of our, our uh insights and ideas really have to do with connecting educational work, both from a systems perspective, in aligning policy at the federal level in the United States and at the state level, but also thinking about the implementation at community colleges, at four-year universities, and across the broader workforce development system in the United States, unions, workforce development boards, and so forth. Um, so, you know, when I think about how do the actors within this broad STEM education and workforce development community work together? I think of a common lexicon, and we at New America believe that skills are the unlock for that alignment. Um, you know, many 
actors in labor markets, whether they're employers or academic institutions uh, or intermediaries, use proxies for skills to determine who to hire, to evaluate readiness for jobs. Those proxies could be years of experience. Those proxies could be degrees and credentials. It could be, be the pedigree of which somebody obtained their degree, that they go to an Ivy League institution or not, um, uh, or other biased indices too. People use proxies like gender or race to assume certain attributes that candidates bring to jobs. We believe that skills-based hiring and skills-based education is an equalizer and an unlock for greater alignment. And the reason why we think that is because, you know, thinking about at least the post-secondary system, the status quo approach at most colleges and universities to prepare students not just to pursue their, their you know, interests and ambitions, but to find jobs um, is typically to lean on faculty expertise, right? Um, you know, this approach that um, faculty members know their content best and they're best positioned to teach the skills that students need to obtain the jobs that they want. Um, and what we've found and what others have found over many, many years of analysis is that that approach is actually very risky um, and a bit outdated. Um, faculty do have a great deal of expertise and they're often underappreciated. Um, and they do have skills that they should teach, but it's a bit unrealistic to, um, you know, to ask faculty members to know what employers are looking for down to the level of skill, uh, what specific skills are needed for specific positions that their graduates are seeking. Even the most industry engaged faculty members will face difficulties on staying on top of labor market needs. Understanding labor markets is a full time career. It's a full-time occupation in and of itself. Um, so, you know, that sort of brings to the question of solutions. So if not faculty expertise, what other models allow for the alignment of education with labor market needs? Another vehicle that some colleges and universities, not all, but many and increasingly more, use are industry advisory boards. Having a group of employer partners that meet with faculty who develop curricula to see the alignment of that curricula with what employers are looking for. That's an awesome approach. That's a great approach. Um, you know, um, industry advisory boards allow for the personal relationships. They allow for uh, internships and co-ops and work-based learning and all sorts of university or college partnerships with employers to support student success. Um, but Industry advisory boards, too, are limited. Most industry advisory boards meet at most on the most extreme monthly, and it's typically a dozen or two dozen representatives who are brought together through personal relationships of faculty members or deans or other professionals at the institution, excuse me, institution um, to, you know, think about the alignment between what the institution's teaching and, and what the job market is, is looking for. Um, these would be 90 minute meetings, maybe half day meetings, and it's a great space and it does create a great deal of value. We believe that all institutions should have employer and industry advisory boards, but these structures too are limited in having the scale that institutions need to stay on top of with dynamic labor market demands. So. That goes to another potential solution. Increasingly, we've been seeing the use of real-time labor market information as a really exciting unlock for seeing the uh, forest from the tree, if you will. Whereas the industry advisory boards allow faculty members and deans and those responsible for curricula development to stay on top of the needs of their closest employer partners and have that qualitative touch. Real-time labor market information allows us to scan job postings at an aggregate in a service area or in a set of zip codes even, in a state, in a municipality, in an MSA, a metropolitan statistical area that is, um, that allows us to see what specific skills are being listed on the actual job postings in real time as of yesterday 
not of an advisory meeting that happened six months ago or four months ago or two months ago. Um, and, you know, real-time LMI has been really exciting development. Another two other inputs for real-time LMI are uh, feeding in, you know, LinkedIn profiles and Glassdoor profiles, which allow for inferencing. These are assumptions, they're economic assumptions, but inferencing wage and employment outcomes for folks who pursue certain career paths based on certain levels of credential attainment and skill attainment. Um, so there's a great deal of learnings that institutions can have in aligning their education with labor market needs for better student outcomes using real-time labor market information. At New America, we have been working with community colleges in particular to scale the utility of real-time labor market information. I'll put a couple of links in the chat just in case folks are interested, but um, in partnership with the Lumina Foundation, we have launched the uh, Community College Workforce Transformation and Implementation Cohort, which is a uh, project that really is aimed at building the capacity of community colleges to use data and modernize their data infrastructure to maximize the potential of real-time labor market information for this level of alignment that we're trying to achieve. Um, there are parallel efforts in the four-year ecosystem. Um, IRIS is a big project that really taps into the power of real-time labor market information to have a better sense of alignment at the graduate level and the undergraduate level. Um, at New America, we're deeply focused on the needs and the issues of community colleges because we believe that community colleges are um, are um, need much more attention than they get in the mainstay science policy field and certainly in the workforce development and higher education policy field. Um, and I kind of sit at the intersection of those fields, hence my 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 role here. Um, so. You know, my TLDR uh, uh, answer to your question, Adriana, is I think real-time labor market information is an unlock for employers and education providers to have better alignment between the programs offered and labor market needs down to the currency of skill. So I'll pause there. Thanks very much. Thank you. That's a lot of really good uh, content. And I uh, hope we can come back to this and weave it back into some other other questions. I really like your um, approach to think about skills and as an equalizer. And we'll talk about this as we think about the access side of things too. Um, I think also the idea of thinking about uh, different levels, which we haven't touched on, sort of community college versus the four-year up to now and how that needs to adapt and um, be innovative, really, in the field. Um, also, you touched upon some of the partnerships, too, and we'll, we'll come back to this, too, uh, how, you know, who some of these actors are, because it's not just the, the institutions and how to partner with industry and other players that can help support the system as well. Um, and then, um, of course, the thinking about the labor market, I think that's something that a lot of folks don't think about, or they or they come from the training side, but they don't look at where people are going and going from the other side, which I think is really important um, to to do sort of the, the reverse of what we traditionally think about. So thanks. Um, okay, so um, moving to Kaluris, um, then we want to uh, touch upon the um, sort of inclusion side of things, which has come up um, several times. And I know you've worked on this um, multiple times. And what are, what is sort of your view about how to make the field more inclusive, um, you know, cater to students who are underrepresented and from some of the work you've, you've done too? Thanks, Adriana. Um, <clears throat> So I think there's lots of layers to this. Um, there's a historical context, of course, um, where we are we have higher end institutions that systemically have kept underrepresented groups outside of those spaces. Uh, and so we really have to think about it in terms of like dis disrupting these systems and really talking about policies um, as well as accrediting boards and, and what accrediting boards are expecting of higher ed institutions. Um, 
in order to do this work? Like, are we really in that space to create inclusive environments? Um, and now we just had uh, the Supreme Court tell us we can't use race-based admissions um, in our institutions and how we're gonna navigate that uh, to create these spaces, not just for American citizens, but also our international students that once again, also have to jump through bureaucratic hoops in order to gain access even to get health care, basic things like health care. Um, and so uh, the conversation uh, has to begin at that level. Um, I think what's really amazing about the work of the folks that we have here today is that we're tapping into different student populations from high school all the way up to, again, graduate students um, that are doing this work and that we're trying to bring in transformative work to be done. And it's in the last couple of years, really talking about grassroots movements and conversations with community. For the most part, where we exist in this ivory tower uh, in higher ed institutions where we don't talk to the community and, and don't bring in not just the population of students that we're serving, but who, the community at large and how it is that we're going to engage them. Uh, and so really thinking about how you bring in the skills of being a community organizer uh, and making people comfortable in those spaces, right? Doing away with some of our titles that we so wholeheartedly want to want to attach to um, and engage and humanize uh, the work that we're doing at, as people, not just in policy and nonprofits, but also again in our higher ed institutions, um, talking about tenure and promotion. Uh, today, <laughs> in Inside Higher Ed, there was an article specifically about how people of color are still not being tenured and not being promoted in our institutions. And one of the things that we know in terms of our students is that if they don't see people that look like them, they're not going to come. They're not going to feel comfortable because that himself, in itself makes them feel like I don't belong in this particular space. Um, and so it's absolutely critical to have these particular conversations and, you know, discomfort will happen. Um, I think back of a couple of like 10 years ago, uh, where um, as a, as a, as a, po as a pre-doctoral student, I was funded by the American Psychological Association uh, and always felt like the association was in high, thought of it in high regard. However, um, in thinking about how to create inclusive spaces, mm -hmm. learning that the American Psychological Association was the birthplace of standardized assessments, right? These conversations that we're having about admissions and what's the importance of the SAT and the ACT and the GRE and the LSAT um, and the MCAT. Um, systemically, what it does is that it keeps people of color from those spaces. It keeps international students from being able to engage um, in, in the workforce. It keeps immigrant populations that might have gotten a higher education degree in their home country from being able to work and earn a salary uh, where they can support their families. Um, and it was like shocking to me because these were the people that basically paid for my whole PhD. And I'm, and I'm like, whoa, I took these people's money. Um, and of course I think about it as reparations, but you know, how are we going to move this forward again to create these inclusive spaces? And so I think we need to be comfortable with the language. I mean, I think we need to be comfortable with the question. Um, and when we think about policy, we need to always think about who is it that we're keeping out? Are we keeping out somebody that has a disability? Are we keeping out somebody um, that may um, have a learning difference? And, and why is it that we are keeping out those incredible minds from doing the work that's needed in order for us to address the systemic issues that we have? I mean, we just, we're still, you know, dealing with COVID um, where we saw how it impacted particularly our communities that are underserved. Um, if it's not for those voices, how are we really going to create transformative change? And it has to be at every level. I think we can't conf conform to what we're given, which is typically what we do. We're like, okay, because, you know, we're merit-based people. So we're like, all right, I'm going to navigate those challenges. Um, but really, again, thinking about how you use your knowledge in order to elevate all of these different platforms um, and create those inclusive spaces. It's, I'm a neuroscientist by training, so it's really easy for me to be like, you know, you kind of learned all those biases. Let's kind of unlearn some stuff 
um, so that we can move the work forward. Uh, and you, and so using that knowledge that I worked so hard to obtain um, to be able to navigate people's behaviors and thoughts so that we can create this transformative change. Thank you for those points. I uh, this is these are hard questions to answer, but I I'm also really inspired by the work you're doing at SUNY and other places. You know, we work together and other on other things too. And so uh, thanks for for moving the needle on that. Um, I think also um, just bringing to attention some of the populations we don't often think about uh, students with disabilities and uh, different learning styles and these things that uh, we should keep in mind that um, they they need to be. Um, to feel like they're they belong in the system too so um and the question of role models as well um so I think we've done a good job kind of highlighting what all the problems are I think uh, we're going to spend the last 15 minutes or so talking talking through solutions uh one of the ways that this can happen and Clarice you sort of touched upon this the grassroots efforts of um how we can potentially empower you know, scientists or trainees or folks who are in the field to actually make change from within, which some of us have done. Uh, but then also, what can our organizations do and sort of collectively in the, in this conversation? So I think my next question is, um, if you all have thoughts about it, anyone's welcome to respond to this, is how we can sort of empower folks from within to make the change that they want to see, right? Re recognizing that that can be a burden sometimes, but also I think I want to encourage people to to take action on things that they want to change too. So any thoughts on sort of uh, how to empower people to to change the system from within? Um, I can talk a little bit about some of the programs that are not currently being run, but I'm in the process of developing them because uh, my postdoc fellowship really just got started in like February of this year. So it's only been about um, eight months, but some of the things that I've learned early on from the relationships that I built with the, um, the program leads of each of these institutions that the fellows are based at is that they, they have a lot of like, they have a lot of on their plate and they have a lot of things that they're committed to doing. And so even though they have a lot of these like really like passionate interests and, and like a drive to make some of these, these bigger institutional changes, they kind of don't have the, they're, they're the most taxed people <laughs> that are there. Um, and so as a funder, one of the things that I've been working on creating is kind of like a protected time and protected space for people to develop these ideas. So that can take a lot of different forms. And like, luckily I work at a place where we have um, the resources to develop these ideas. And there's this sort of high risk, high reward element that I think exists in philanthropy that's that makes it a really interesting way to fund things because you don't necessarily need to have everything work or have you know, positive results and um, you can have, you can have ideas that fail and it's really not as big of a deal as it might be if you're funded by the NSF. Um, so some of those ideas are like having a, having a writing retreat or having an idea retreat or a brainstorming retreat that are just this, like the program leads and you bring them all together and you say like, you've got three days <laughs> and a bunch of smart people, like what are some some of your best ideas. There's a lot of facilitation methods that I've learned about um, like for strategies for getting people to, to mentally get to a place where they can think really big because I think a lot of, at least within academia, a lot of people are kind of trained to like lower their expectations and put forward ideas that are like incremental. And it's it's, I think a lot of reinforcement of being rejected has resulted in when you're trying to make a change, you just ask for like the smallest possible change you can. And even then you're like usually rejected. Um, and so I think one of the great things about working in philanthropy is we we have the ability to make these big investments. But I think one of the ironically strange things that you run into sometimes is that people like have trouble imagining what that might be in any like specific way because they just don't spend that much time exercising that part of their brain. Um, so finding time and space to help people develop ideas um, and exploring different pathways for how those might be implemented, I think are some of the, the, the things that I have been interested in and that I think we're gonna work on a lot, a lot more in the future. 
That's a really interesting framing. Um, thanks for that input. Um, let me ask Stephen to follow up on this because I think you're sort of in this space of uh, awarding or rewarding ideas or maybe helping sort of develop that. How do you think about this? I mean, I, you know, I think um, the Academy itself isn't in the same position that Schmidt Futures is. not We don't have as much kind of freedom to um, take these high risk, high reward um, chances on programs itself, but uh, uh, rewarding the people who are doing this kind of work um, so that they are at least so that they have the freedom to take those chances is definitely a big part of the awards that we um, we run. In terms of like what in terms of what we do at the academy, I I try to think about you know the tools I I have access to as an or, or we have access to as an organization, and I uh, in this space I see it like a lot of potential as a platform. And what I've been trying to do more is to, when I have an opportunity, to elevate the folks who are doing this work on the ground and give them a platform to a wider audience to talk about what what they're doing. Um, to start to move the culture in that direction. Um, so, you know, as part of our awards, we have uh, advisors that contribute to the shape of the awards and also participate in some of the programming. Um, and the Academy has a whole half of its business, which is devoted to scientific programming. We, we run conferences on kind of more uh, niche scientific areas. And I try kind of wherever I can to bring in uh, a broader perspective um, bring in folks from underrepresented uh, areas, bring in people from kind of less um, name brand institutions, uh, because you know, as, as uh, the panel's brought up earlier, broader perspective, broader diversity of thought um, is really important. So that, that's kind of how I, I think about it at the Academy at least. That's great. Um, that's interesting to think through what kind of platform the academies can provide for some mm -hmm. of this. Um, and I think following on, so you mentioned kind of advisors and other folks to help shepherd this through. Uh, maybe I'll ask Kaluris to follow up on this and say, since you know, you're know you um, teaching students and how you sort of support them from your role. Yeah, I think what's come up for me in the last couple of years and seeing again, uh, the climate um, that a lot of our communities also, in order for students to feel empowered, for people to be empowered in this space, is that there needs to be a lot of healing and there needs to be a lot of like understanding of where we come from. So many times um, people are leading from a place of trauma. Uh, and as you continue to engage in that work, if you don't have an honest conversation um, as to like how we got here, that trauma will end up hurting people. So I think for the most part, you know, these policies are made to again embrace merit um and to to you know have people meet these really high standards um and it, it's really gatekeeping <laughs> um and what we're doing is that we continue to perpetuate the exclusionary policies uh that don't allow for there to be diversity uh in the workforce or in our communities which again negatively impact outcomes so no we're not creating vaccines for everybody because all the clinical trials are white men and so you don't know what's going to happen with other populations uh and so really creating those th these spaces not just for ourselves i think the other thing that's huge in terms of doing inclusion and equity work is that we also need to work on ourselves so it's not that's just that healing aspect but also that self reflection of like what, how, why, how is it that I'm perpetuating and creating these spaces of, of exclusion? Um, who is it that I'm not talking to? Uh, why is it that I'm not talking to them? Um, do they not have a role to play in this space? And so in thinking about how I put together my lab, in thinking about how I put together student advisory groups, in thinking about who I'm tapping into in order to develop policy, like where, where are my blind spots? Um, because even as folks uplift us as leaders in this space, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be checked at all times. Um, so with that self-reflection and with, with that healing comes progress, right? So once we identify all of those things that are blocking us from doing transformative work, then we can tackle them together. And so it might mean that when you start a meeting, you know, you start talking about what your background is on your phone um, and how that connects you to other people and create a space where we kind of just like let go of, again, of the titles of the hierarchy so that we can come 
together collectively to have a collective vision to move the work forward. Um, and I think that, uh, that that aspect of humanity um, really has to be centered in these particular spaces um, because again, we've worked really, really hard. Like I get it. We worked really, really hard to get these titles and to get to where we are and have our paychecks um, be because we're survivors. Uh, but to bring other people in, like we just, those titles are not necessarily what should be centered. Yeah, really great points there. And um, one thing to think about is um, how this should be adapted. We sort of talked about this too, but sort of the different levels of education, but also uh, different countries, right? So we have a lot of folks in this conference who are uh, from the US and, and other places too. So some of these things are universal, but then adapting to, I think, particular environments and how the education is in, in that space um, makes sense too. So I think maybe uh, I'll ask Leah to expand on this because you have maybe a broader perspective of how education needs to change and kind of how do you think about this question? Yeah, I've been thinking about this and it's actually exactly what you mentioned that um, a mechanism that I think can work is if we encourage, usually through funding, um, really equitable partnerships and collaborations. And as I mentioned before, you know, our scientists at our lab in California can form a collaboration with a clinical research partner um, in Kenya. And that's good for both parties. And, but thinking even more about my own training. So my, um, as an undergraduate, when I was just getting interested in being a researcher, I was at a small liberal arts school and I had good exposure to scientific research, but what was really transformative is that my PI had a longstanding collaboration with someone at a large university. And I actually got to go to their lab and train for a week, um, you know, at the end of my summer of undergraduate research. And that really opened my eyes. I had never met postdocs and grad students and seen an NMR machine that was two stories tall. You know, it was just a really cool experience for me. And so this model of collaboration I think can really scale, you know, when we know that funding gets funneled to the same institutions, to the same researchers, to the same countries, if we can tap into that and force them, encourage those powerful bodies to collaborate with others who they don't traditionally reach out to, community colleges, primarily undergraduate institutions, other country, you know, like you can really put this partnership collaboration model um, in so many directions. So I think that can be a really powerful mechanism that benefits right. everyone, um, you know, not just the people who we think we're helping, but it, it can, as Calorie said, if we really reframe and think about how it benefits ourselves to to, to reframe your own thinking, it's, it's good for everyone. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And also I like your personal story there too, and how kind of, I think ourselves being in different environments can, um, and shape our perspectives on this too. Um, and so Shailen, then um, you talked a lot about kind of innovation and partnerships, community building. Um, you have sort of a broad perspective on this. Um, what thoughts do you have following this conversation? So a couple of things come to mind for me. I, I just wanted to take a minute to double click on uh, Clarice, Leah, Brittany, I think well, the three of you mentioned this in your comments, but the burden of reform should not fall on those with the least amount of power, privilege, and money. So, uh, you know, uh, while I think it's very important and exciting to empower, you know, the next generation in, in the conversation, the responsibility is not theirs. Um, and, you know, I think, I think, um, the, the frame that we've been using at New America is that of consumer protection and of accountability uh, across education and across the private sector, too. Um, so when we think about sort of systemic reform, um, my mind immediately goes to policy, uh, being at a think tank. That's that's what we do. Um, and I do think there are substantive ways for, you know, early career or mid career uh, scientists and engineers to meaningfully, substantively engage in policy. 
Um, I'd be remiss, Adriana, if I didn't mention our own organization, JSPG, as one vehicle for getting some training and getting your ideas out there. Um, you know, I'll put this in the chat. Journal of Science Policy and Governance publishes uh, a wide array of science, technology, and innovation policy memos and op-eds and white papers covering the widest possible range of topics in this field, including reforming STEM education and workforce development. And it can be a great vehicle for students to gain some new skills for free or maybe even paid um, and, you know, really get their ideas out into the into the policy sphere, into the orbit, if you will. Um, another organization I put on the radar, um, uh, giving a nod to our Schmidt colleagues, uh, Federation of American Scientists, the Day One Project, is a great opportunity for, um, you know, early career scientists and students and people from within, you know, to use the term, uh, to think about how they can influence the policy dialogue while maintaining their day to day. Right? It's it's tricky for me because. I, I really do believe that that you know we've seen in the past several years, especially you know groups like National Science Policy Group. Um, there's been this surge of momentum from the next generation, and that is needed. That change from within is necessary, but that responsibility should not fall on early career people. That responsibility should fall upon policy advocates to keep accountable the institutions that have set up. The, the system that we have today. So um, the other thing that I'd suggest just in terms of, you know, how to support um, narrative change in support of the systems change is storytelling. Uplift the stories of those closest to the problems you're trying to solve. Um, one of the, my mentors once told me that, and I've held on to it ever since. Um, there's an organization called the Op-Ed Project for people who are interested. The Op-Ed Project helps um, anyone, really, but especially underrepresented voices um, uh, have their stories heard in the media by placing op-eds in news outlets. Um, if you'd like to join the Op-Ed Project, please reach out to me. I'm easily findable. Uh, I can get you discount codes or have you signed up for free. I serve as on the, uh, the advisory board for this group. Um, storytelling, I think, is a great way for folks from within to affect the media conversation, which has a direct influence on the policy dialogue. So um, those are three resources that come to mind. Um, but I, I guess my main message is we should make sure that the fire is put on the feet of those responsible. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, thanks for making that point. I think it's it's a good um wrap up as we think about reform um sort of the last section of this and in just in just a time we'll, we'll end a little bit early um but want to also just go around and get other people's thoughts about how we can move the needle and and for the systems change to actually happen um steven you want to go first Not super prepared for this right now. I'd love to hear some other thoughts before I weigh in. I'm sorry. <laughs> sure. Who would like to go? I mean, I can say some of the things that we've been doing at CUNY, um, specifically at the CUNY School of Medicine, which is a unique BSMD program. We take students straight out of high school and accept them into medical school, no MCAT. Um, with the mission of changing the face of healthcare. Uh, and we definitely understand that we, and we're the most diverse medical school in the whole country. Um, most of our students come from immigrant families and from low-income families. Uh, and it's probably the first experience that a lot of them have had in being in integrated spaces because most of our kids in New York City, particularly, they exist in a very segregated school and housing system. Um, and our professoriate does not reflect the 55% of Black and Latino students that we have. Uh, and so in thinking about that these last couple of years, we've we've challenged the institution. Um, our, while CUNY in general has a 90 to 92% tenure and promotion rate, the CUNY School of Medicine has a 50% 
tenure and promotion rate. And so we were wondering like, what is that about? Um, one, it's a medical school, LCME accreditation, uh, which provides certain confines. Um, but also because we're unique in the sense that it's a BSMD program, we have a, and it's a small faculty, our professoriate is incredibly stretched. Um, and so while you're running your research lab, you also have to teach, you also have to mentor um, and provide that supportive space for students. So we've challenged those tenure and promotion policies, um, not just at the CUNY School of Medicine, but also in challenging at CUNY at large, more and more we're seeing that, particularly faculty of color are leaving the professoriate. Um, which, you know, if y'all are working in, in think tanks and nonprofits and changing policy, that's amazing. But then that also creates a leaky pipeline to who our students see in front of them. Um, and so how are we going to address that? Uh, and, and, and create that, that change that they need. Um, because the only way that we're going to pull them up is if we're in those positions of power. Uh, so challenging these practices, um, looking at funding streams and challenging the NIH, um, being part of organizations like Future of Research that has been part of advocating for pay parity for postdocs, but also being in work groups um, at NIH challenging these policies. Um, those are critical steps. Um, so it's not just taking like local policy. Um, I also serve on the New York City School Board. So really thinking about like how kids are coming into college <laughs> um, and creating those pathways. Again, um, using that, using your title to create those opportunities for other people um, has been a critical step in, in opening those doors for a more diverse workforce in general um, that is more community driven. That's great, great points, thank you. Um, Brittany, anything from the Schmidt perspective? Um, beyond some of the things that I mentioned earlier about trying to provide some some resources and space for, for idea generation that we, we could potentially fund or find co-funders for, um, I think that at least personally, and like this is really just restricted to my own program that I'm running, um, I, there's a sense of like there if, but for the grace of God, like sometimes I think people in roles like such as ours, you feel like, oh my God, if I wasn't here, like who would be there to like stop people from doing things? <laughs> and so I try to, I try to like integrate things as much as possible and write like policies and talk to my colleagues about like the, the ways in which we're making decisions. And as a funder, I think um, from in a philanthropy, at least there, there, are, there, there's more flexibility, which is a positive thing but flexibility can also be kind of a negative thing. So you have to kind of keep an eye on the ways that people are strategizing, spending, spending dollars. Um, and so for, for my program, something I really have tried to embody is this idea that we want to like positively reinforce the grantees who are doing things that we, that are aligning with our values. And so if you have like a very diverse group of fellows and you've got lots of diverse programming and you're, you're teaching interesting things and it's it's like a really vibrant um, fellowship program that we want to have be a model for the other for the other programs that we run, then we will consider like developing further programs. So like you want to reinforce the people that are doing the good things. Um, I know that's not really like, I mean, within behavioral neuroscience, like I'm sure there's lots of strategies. You can, punishment is also a great tool. <laughs> Um, I tend to, um, try to guide people through reward. So if you're like, my program isn't getting, um, isn't being funded further and they are, we're not getting additional slots for additional fellows. then I think that's like a conversation we should have about like your selection process and the makeup of the people that are in your program and things, things like that. And so I think there's this positive reinforcement that we're trying to uh, engage with our partners to, to further align with the values that we have. And that that is things like, are there immigrant scientists in your program? Are there women in your program? Are there underrepresented? And underrepresented, by the way, means something different in every country. So like in the United States, it might mean one thing. And in the Middle East, it might mean another thing. And in Europe, it might mean a third thing. And so like kind of really understanding the culture that you're, you're like funding 
and like how to meet the needs of those people and how to how to understand um, kind of how they define the things differently than we might define things is, is another part of my job. Um, I know that that didn't really end on a logical like conclusion, but I would say positive reinforcement is probably the best tool that a funder can use. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And I like the points about aligning with values and also what we should be supporting financially um, from where you're set. Um, that's important to consider. Uh, I think that's a good transition to Leah. Um, what are your thoughts on this? I don't think I have that much more to add. Um, you know, I, I, I think everyone has already made some great points and just wanted to reiterate the point that Brittany just made about really listening to the populations you're trying to serve or the communities or the target audience of, you know, we can project as much onto someone what we think they need or should be, I don't know, happening, but um, really listening to communities, whatever community that is, you know, we're talking globally or locally, um, but letting letting the people impacted lead is is really important. All right, and Stephen, back to you. Hopefully, this gives you some ideas. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I I, I didn't uh, do this particularly gracefully a couple minutes ago, but really, I just wanted to let everyone else speak. Um, I I I can feel in a, a strange position sometimes in these conversations um, as part of the New York Academy of Sciences because, like, as um, it's a nonprofit, but it's also kind of positioned as very solidly part of the Ivory Tower. Um, and particularly like oh, like awards that we give our career awards, which means as much as kind of we try to do outreach and, and balance the rubrics, um, it's still going to favor the same kind of metrics and uh, and advantages um, that are baked into the system. Um, so I I'm I'm I am part of the system, and like what I what I try to do in my work is some of that internal change to try to balance the scales a little bit from the end of the system, basically. Um, but mostly I, I, I don't have all of the answers and I, I really just want to listen to the folks who are taking, um, taking big swings at making some of this, that systemic change. Can, can I interrupt to make just another yeah, comment please. that that's kind of building on um, like in a way we're all like a little bit powerless because we're <laughs> discussing like institutional changes that are far, far beyond, you know, even the big, even the biggest money philanthropists can't change the fact that if you don't have a bunch of nature papers, you're not going to get tenure. <laughs> like, like I can't change that, but I think that there are like little things that you can, you can encourage people to do, but a lot of this has to be through like reinforcement. And so I think, um, Something that I'm gonna post this in the chat, something that I've been thinking about trying to like suggest that people start to like you can I, I can as a as a not like federal grantor, I can't force people to do anything. When you work in a philanthropy, you basically give people money and say it would be really nice if you used it for X, Y, or Z. But it's different than working at the NIH. Um, and so I think there are there are things that you can encourage people to do, and there are like other avenues that, that you can explore like open science and these things that are like focused on giving credit and maybe transitioning away from like having publication record be the like most important thing that people consider when they're looking at hiring faculty members who like you need a lot of other skills besides can you write you know, a good cover letter to the editor at Nature. You need other skills to be like a successful scientist. That's probably one of the skills that unfortunately you do need, but it's not the only one that you need. And so I think I think trying to work some of these other things into like the systems that already exist are like some ways that we can start to inch towards more equity. But like, I have a similar problem to what Stephen has, which is that the programs that we work on are already people that have risen beyond a lot of the obstacles that exist. So like, I see people who haven't been discriminated, well, I mean, maybe they have, but they haven't been like 
discouraged to the point of quitting academia. They made it to their postdoc and like, that's when I see them or they made it to their, to their tenure track job, which is when Steven sees them. And so you've already, people have gone through all of these obstacles to get to this point. And like, we can do what we can from our perspective, but there are like so many institutional, institutional problems that are kind of beyond the little programs that we run. Sorry, that was kind of depressing. <laughs> yeah, no, Coloris, if you have anything to add from the institution. Yeah. Perspective. I mean, it's, I mean, facts, that's it. Um, but what I was going to say is I, I do think that even in the research space, so I'm an addiction researcher and about mm, three or four years ago, NIDA was thinking, was, was transforming its blueprint and when uh, some of the work that's being done now, right, if we really want to treat people that are misusing substances, we have to understand our communities and we have to understand like why they're misusing these substances. And so more and more what you're seeing is that grants are actually asking for like community driven approaches for substance misuse, right? We're talking about harm reduction. We're talking about overdose prevention sites, um, which uh, East Harlem is the first in the country to have an overdose prevention site. Um, and so I think that we also need to start talking to our young people and our colleagues um, about how are you doing this work? We can't avoid it at this point. If we're really trying to, again, transform science, treat human beings um, in terms of, again, any sort of pathology that they might have, we have to be able to understand their community. And it has to be something that we we talk to students about from the moment they come into our classrooms, whether it be undergraduate or graduate. Um, these are skills that you're going to need to have in the future, no matter how much chat GPT we have in this world. The, that that connection has to exist and you have to be able to be multidisciplinary in your approach. So even though I'm a bench scientist, if I'm not talking to folks that are in the clinic and folks that are in the community, I'm not going to be able to address patterns of substance misuse. Um, and so these are skill, I think that we're, I think we're scratching the surface um, and I think we're in a critical point in terms of that transformational change. And if we don't continue to talk about it in these spaces, then we're going to lose a big opportunity um, that we have now in terms of again transforming that work and making it a more inclusive and equitable space. If we are like, oh, ivory tower, uh -uh, whatever, like let, let, let the white boys do what they do. No offense. Um, we're just not, things aren't going to change. So in our programs and in, in these mentoring spaces, we have to continue to bring in like the soft, the soft skills and bringing in community. It's not just for the people that are community-based organizations. Like it is your responsibility as a scientist to understand these different nuances, um, to be able to support your community and move your research forward so that you can, can continue to get funded. Like look at this whole blueprint. Um, and so those are things that, Maybe people, again, you know, we micro focus on like, this is the receptor and this is the ligand and this is the signal transduction pathway that I'm going to interact with in order to do this treatment. But if it doesn't freaking work on behavior, like what are you going to do? Um, so again, we have to think about those those strategy points at every angle um, and have uh, this multifaceted approach. Yes, very good point. I think, um, and I know we, we want to end a little bit early today, like some folks need to leave, but uh, that's a great point to end on, I think, uh, thinking through different levels. Um, hopefully, we gave the audience some ideas about change from this conversation. Uh, we should continue to have more conversations and, and think really strategically about how this change needs to happen. But I really appreciate everyone's perspectives here. And um, hopefully each of us in our communities can can contribute to to the change we want to see in our in our um, in our work. Um, so to end, um, I will share my LinkedIn here. If the panelists would like to share, please continue this discussion. Connect with us. Um, we will post a recording on YouTube and can share it out. 
Um, there will be a proceedings coming out of the whole science summit. Um, so if you have resources or links you'd like to add in, uh, please send it to me and uh, we can we can write that up and we'll send that out um, to participants as well. So thank you again for joining today and um, have a great rest of your week.